welcome you again tonight to another Livingston Baptist Church live stream of the service here. And uh, we're thankful that you joined us tonight. And uh, I tell you what, I miss church. I really do. And uh, I miss you all. And uh, I tell you, I, I just was thinking about it today. I, I miss just seeing the cars pull up in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. That's how bad I've got it right now. And anytime I see somebody, I, we, I was, we have uh, Lisa Lenart. She's going to sing here for us in just a few minutes. I told her I hadn't seen her in about a year. And uh, it does seem like that. You know, it just seems like we hadn't seen somebody in a while. It's just so good to be able to see them again. And I can just imagine, can't you, of how it's going to be when we can all get back together again. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody said, whenever we get back together, the first time we need to have dinner on the ground. Well, <laughs> I'm not against that. And uh, I'm always, you know, Baptist and food go together. And uh, I told you about my cookies. I've already gotten in trouble about the cookies this morning that I told you about. But anyway, um, we're so thankful, though, that we can go to you all by this technology. But let me just say this, please, please don't get used to not coming to church and don't get used to that. I really believe that, you know, it's one thing to be able to see this over uh, Facebook, but you know, it's a completely different experience to be able to come to church and church is beneficial in many different ways. But you know, one of the ways that's beneficial is that we get to encourage one another just by being in each other's presence. And uh, I tell you, there's so much to uh, being together as a church. It's very, very important. And we need that fellowship. And uh, we're just hoping and praying that, you know what? I almost just want to say, hey, we're going to have church next Sunday, you know? But I just can't do that. But uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll have it here before long. And um, today, we're uh, one day closer to the Lord's return. That's right. Amen. And uh, we're thankful Amen. for that. And uh, I like what the preacher said. I read the back of the book, and we win. That's and right. I know that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, we don't need to be discouraged tonight. I know if it's been a while since we've seen each other, and it's easy sometimes to get down because God made people to be social. He made us to be that way. And uh, when we don't have that, it's easy to get uh, uh, discouraged, an old uh, country term, cantankerous. <laughs> it's easy to get that way. But uh, listen, we're going to have a good time tonight. And uh, I'm excited about the sermon tonight. And uh, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 47. And uh, we've been in Psalm chapter 46. We're going to Psalm chapter 47 tonight. So if you've got your Bible, you can get there. But we're going to be a little bit before we get there. I'm going to ask Brother Rick to come. And he's going to lead us in a song, Showers of Blessing. And uh, hey, wherever you're at, I mean, if you're right there in your, in your home, somewhere close by, uh, just sing with us. We'd love to have you sing with us. And uh, I can't hear you. And you can't, well, you'll probably be able to hear us. But anyway, we'd hope that you can just join us and just be a part of the worship to the Lord tonight. Brother Rick, would you come? Drops from the surf falling up for the showers. 
would like to uh, give you a special prayer request this evening. Uh, we, uh, of course, need to continue to remember the special prayer request that we mentioned this morning. Uh, Lori Gentry uh, had a bad reaction to a blood transfusion. And then uh, Ricky Rooks, I understand, has got a very short life expectancy right now. They're saying probably within 24 hours or so that he'll pass out of this life. So please pray for uh, his family, if you would. And then the others that we had also made mention of, we prayed for uh, Nikki McLeod and Debbie Bracey, especially in our nation. And uh, we have a new request I want to let you be aware of tonight. We have a teenage boy in our church by the name of Zane Harrelson. And uh, Zane was in a car accident this afternoon. And uh, he is actually at the hospital now. And I wish I had more details to give you, but really I don't have any. Um, we're just going to have to wait and see. But please pray. And uh, as uh, he's trying, well, and the whole family uh, just needs your prayers at this time, if you would. Uh, then, you know, I think it's a good idea also, you know, any time it seemed like that the nation of Israel went through a tough time, whether it was being attacked by an enemy or uh, being attacked in some other way, uh, it seemed like the very first thing that the man of God did and, and that the prophet of God did is encourage God's people to confess their sins and uh, to be involved in repentance and to turn from their sins. I was just thinking about that song as we were singing it the, that verse says, now as to God, we're confessing. That's right. You know what? True showers of blessing come after confession of sin. That's right. You know, I just want to encourage you tonight. We're just having a little bit of prayer time. If you could just sort of think about in your own heart, not so much just trying to analyze uh, the sins of somebody else. You, you can't confess sin for somebody else. And uh, you can only confess your own. And uh, so I'm just asking you tonight as we think about and we're getting ready to have a moment of prayer, uh, just tell God about some of the things in your life. If God brings something to your mind, pray, if, pray about it. Say, God, would you just bring to my mind, I want to be thoroughly right with God. Yes. And uh, if you are that, I believe then God can, uh, of course, bless our lives and I believe that in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 as well, we definitely need to make sure that uh, we are uh, confessed up and that God can, we puts us in a position where God can bless our lives. And I hope that you will. Now, I believe there's room for repentance in every Christian. I don't believe it's just in part. I believe everybody has certainly things that happen every day that we need to spend time at the end of the day uh, confessing. And certainly uh, certainly we need to confess national sins. I, there's a place for that. I'm not discouraging that. But I also want us to just be uh, willing and obedient to uh, just confess those sins on our own personal level. And uh, i like for us to think about those things. And let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now and ask God's uh, blessing on these requests and then as we focus tonight, let's just do that and focus on repentance and then on, on the confession of sin tonight. I believe that's so very important. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful tonight that I can come to you and call you Father. Lord, that is a term of endearment. It's a, it's a term, Lord, where we are so grateful that we have someone that is willing to call us children willing to call us sons and daughters and that we can in return call out on your name and say our heavenly father or our father which art in heaven. And Father, tonight we do pray for the requests that are on our church prayer list. We ask you please to meet every need individually and be the strong and mighty God that you are to them. We think especially tonight for Zane Harrelson, just a teenage boy, but got in a car accident this afternoon. I, Lord, not being able to go to the hospital and not being able to 
check in like I would want to. Dear God, we just are left with a lot of questions right now. But we ask you please to uh, be with him. And, uh, and Lord, the seriousness, you know all about it. And so, Father, I pray that you would touch him and help him and heal him. And then, Lord, we pray for the family, too, as I'm sure this is a shock to them, that you would give them grace during this time. And then, Lord, we pray for those that are going to be having tests here very soon. I think about Miss Nikki McLeod going to be having a test this week. And uh, we uh, don't know if it's heart-related or not. But, Lord, the problems that she's having... It may just be that. And so, Father, please help her. And then we pray that you would also bless uh, Miss Debbie Bracey and then others. Lord, I think of Ricky Rooks, who is at death's door even tonight. And then we think about also uh, the other requests that we have mentioned as well. And, Lord, our list is really full as a church prayer list from, from just uh, family members and friends and acquaintances that just need a special touch from you. And so please, Lord, would you minister and touch as only you can. And then, Lord, I pray tonight that you would just, as we focus tonight also on just the confession of our own sins, Lord, so often we will go perhaps even days without even thinking of this. But Lord, it shouldn't be that. Lord, we should be constantly aware of anything that comes in between our fellowship with you. And Lord, how important that relationship is and that fellowship with you, that sin breaks that fellowship. And Lord, as a result, the blessings that you want to give us are held back. And Father, you tell us in your word that in times when it seems like uncertainty, we learn through experiences, through the word of God, that these are times when we just need to look at ourselves and analyze and just confess sins in our life. And Lord, I pray as we are gathered here tonight that you would remind us of the things that are wrong in our life that we need to get right because Lord, we need your blessing. We want your blessing. And Lord, you desire to give us that blessing. And so, Father, we do pray tonight that you would bless in a very real way. Please bless this service. Lord, I'm excited to be here tonight to present your word. And I pray that it'll be a blessing to every person that tunes in tonight. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. This time, I'm going to ask Lisa Lenarch to come and sing a song. And I know that you'll enjoy it. Lisa. With great love he gave it, 
He was crucified on a tree that he created with great love for man. God stayed with his plan and he grew the tree so that we might go free. With tears in his eyes, God looked down through time, saw him spat upon, rejected and mocked. Still he grew the tree that he knew would be. stayed with his plan. He grew the tree so that we might go free. Yes, he grew the tree that he Think about that. Mm. The very tree he knew Christ would die on, his only begotten son, he grew that. And my, what a great, powerful song. Thank you, Lisa. I want to ask Brother Rick to come and sing us chorus right before we sing, right before preaching tonight. His name is wonderful. And in that song, you'll see where it says, he is the king, all right? Mm. He said, uh, in fact, let me get the words, he is the mighty king. In uh, Psalm chapter number 47, where we're going to be tonight, it talks about God being the great king. And this song here just goes, dovetails right in with the message tonight. And so I hope that you can sing it with us. Brother Rick, won't you come and lead it to us? tonight. We encourage you to get a Bible and uh, it's good to be able to still look along in the Word of God and make sure I'm preaching what I ought to be preaching, all right? Uh, Psalm chapter number 47 tonight. We have been for the last couple of weeks in Psalm chapter number 46 and uh, we are going to be in Psalm 47 tonight 
this is actually a sequel to uh, Psalm chapter 46. And uh, I'm going to begin reading tonight uh, the, just the first four verses to begin with in this great psalm, Psalm chapter 47. And the Bible says in verse number one, O clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. And that word Selah means let's stop and let's think about what we had just said or what we had just read. Now, I want to say, first of all, tonight, Psalm 47 is connected to Psalm chapter 46. Psalm number 46 is written, if you've not listened to the messages before, Psalm 46 was written during an impending crisis. And it was written during a time of possible annihilation of the Jewish people. Uh, that's what happened to the other cities uh, where the Assyrian army had attacked and conquered them. And now the Assyrian army was oppressing the holy city of Jerusalem. This impending attack caused King Hezekiah to go to God in prayer. That's when he pins Psalm 46. He tells us three things in Psalm 46. Number one, God is our refuge. Right. Second of all, God is our river. Number three, God is our ruler. Psalm chapter 46 tells us of the coming attack of the Assyrian army. And it tells us how King Hezekiah refused to give in to the threats of fear and to the compromises that had been offered him. And rather than him seeking peace through compromise, uh, Hezekiah goes to God and God responds in a miraculous way. The miraculous way is that God sends one angel, just one, and that one angel in one night kills 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, mighty men of war, uh, experienced men of war, and by doing so, God protects and he preserves the people of God. What an amazing act of faith in God that Hezekiah had and, it, and actually showed seeing before him the mighty uh, uh, soldiers of the Assyrian army and then at the same time recognizing his own weakness. Mm -hmm. By the way, that is a factor or a quality that very few people seem to have nowadays. Right. And that is to realize the devil's a whole lot bigger than we are right. and that we are weak, but we need somebody strong on our behalf. Yes. And so King Hezekiah realized that he was weak and that, uh, that God was, uh, uh, he was weaker actually than his, even his enemy was. And he called on God by faith and in prayer. Now, that's not the message tonight, but let me just say this. In times of difficulty, there ought to be somebody in every home that calls on God. That's right. In times of difficulty, listen, there ought to be a preacher behind every pulpit. There ought to be folks across America tonight that will stand and pray to the God of heaven and will say, it doesn't matter what the odds are, I am going to call on God by faith, Amen. believing that God will hear and answer prayer. Yes, sir. I'm thankful tonight. I, I'm thrilled tonight that I have a God that hears when I pray. Yes. I am so thankful for that. And so now here, uh, here's what I imagine happens the night before this expected attack from the enemy and that the enemy is actually imposing thoughts upon King Hezekiah's mind 
and it will send him to write Psalm number 46. Go with me, if you will, in your mind, and just as you can just imagine the watchers on the wall that night. They have a sleepless night. This night is not like the other nights. In fact, the many nights before, uh, perhaps many nights before, they could check their post and perhaps even sit in a chair and relax to a degree, not going to sleep, of course, but they're there as they're uh, just watching over the, the, the city. This night, however, a very sleepless night, knowing that all day long, the Assyrians have gathered themselves around Jerusalem and they have been preparing for an invasion at sunlight. The watchers on the wall, they go up and down. They are pacing this night. Their eyes are peeled throughout the darkness, just wondering when the first surprise attack is going to take place. They are their eyes are very peeled. There is an adrenaline rush going through their body as they are waiting for the Assyrians to unleash the strength of their army. Hezekiah the king, Isaiah the prophet, no doubt that night had a very sleepless night. As the dawn begins to break, the king and the prophet, I'm can imagine them making their rounds as they go to the soldiers that are stationed on the walls and throughout the city. And I believe that they are doing their best to encourage all of the men of war. I believe they're trying to inspire them to trust in God. Don't just trust in the weapons that you have, but trust in God. Right. They look out over the Assyrian camp as the sun begins to rise. The sun begins to come down into the valley. And there's a strange silence that falls over the land. There's no movement in the enemy camp. There's no stirring. There's no call to arms. There's just complete silence. The sun rises higher and higher into the sky. And the king sends out spies into the camp to see what's going on. I mean, have they changed their strategy or what's going on? There's been absolutely not one soul that has come out of their tent and what's going on? Has the attack been delayed? And in a short while, I can just imagine as the spies begin to come back into the city and they stand before King Hezekiah, almost breathless, their eyes are wide with amazement as they say, King Hezekiah, we want you to know that the Assyrians in every single tent are dead. They're, they're not alive. Something has happened in the middle of the night. These soldiers, listen, they are there. It's like they died in their sleep. Their weapons of war are laying right beside them. They're covered up with their blankets. They're there, but they're dead. Their life has been completely snuffed out and all of them have just died in their sleep. They begin to notice birds of prey. I can imagine as vultures begin to fly overhead and eagles and ravens and all of the birds of prey as they begin to sense death in the valley. That's what leads to Psalm 47. You can imagine as Hezekiah looked across the land, the doors now of the city of Jerusalem begin to open. Windows begin to open. Word begins to spread that God has killed the enemy. And can you imagine the excitement of the people? I mean, can, can you imagine the rejoicing and the dancing in the streets as they learn about what God had done to the Assyrian army? Never again would this Assyrian army march on the Judean hills. Hezekiah goes back to his room. 
It's the same room where just the night before he penned Psalm 46. And now the very next day he is penning Psalm 47. He then picks up his pen and he begins to write in Psalm 46. God is our, excuse me, the same room that he penned Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He now picks up the pen and he says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great God, excuse me, a great king over all the earth. The people now are shouting with joy. Hey, take, take the fans of a championship football team, multiply it by 10, okay? <laughs> Maybe even more. And can you imagine how that the whole city begins to clap and to shout and to dance in the streets and they're chanting praises to God and they're a shouting, the Assyrians are dead. The Assyrians are dead. Now, Hezekiah, while all of this commotion is going on, I'm sure he joined in with them for a while, but Hezekiah draws himself away from the crowd and he picks up, now get this, a pen of prophecy. And as he looks on the field of dead bodies, God allows Hezekiah to see well into the future. And he begins to write about the defeat of the world's army in the valley of Megiddo that ushers in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. This psalm is actually could be entitled the millennial psalm because this psalm is talking about when Jesus Christ comes to rule and reign on this earth. And I come from Psalm 47 tonight to remind Christians once again to rejoice because we're on the winning side. Amen. Amen. We are on the winning side tonight. And Hezekiah begins by saying, clap your hands, rejoice. He's, he's really saying in essence, we don't serve just a king, we serve the king of the earth. We serve the king of kings. And what I'd like to do tonight is I'd like to walk you down through this passage. There are two divisions in this song. First of all, there is a great prophecy. That's found in verses one through four. Uh, let, let me add a footnote right here before I go any further. It's important to note, listen, as we look at scripture, anytime there is a rejoicing of, because of victory in, in, in the scriptures, it is because of the people of God that are in the will of God. That's right. Now listen, we can't enjoy or anticipate victory and enjoy the, the ramifications of victory in our life uh, or the reward of victory in our life until first of all, we are a people of God and second of all, that we are in the will of God. We need both of those things. You know what tonight, if you have never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen, you're not on the winning side. You're not on the winning team. Uh, but listen, I wanna say this. You can be, oh, yes. That's right. and God wants you to be. And uh, listen, God wants you to be saved more than you want to be saved. That's right. He wants to save you from your sin. He wants you to be a part of his family. And I want to say tonight, I'm glad to be a part of God's family. It's the best family Amen. I've ever been in, Amen. and I'm so thankful to be a part of God's family. Now listen, if you're a child of God and you're out of the will of God, you need to understand that punishment always comes to sin and disobedience. Right. It always does. I believe tonight, listen, I believe this with all my heart, the best place in all the world to be is in the center of God's will. That's right. I want to ask you something tonight. Are you in the center of God's will? 
I certainly hope that you are. Now listen, the first division in this chapter is a great prophecy that was made by King Hezekiah. He's going to prophesy that God is the almighty king and he will never be defeated. That's right. We're going to talk about that. He will one day pronounce judgment on sin and he will one day pronounce judgment on Satan and God will rule and reign in this world in righteousness. Oh, yes. And uh, the basis of his prophecy, now don't miss this, the basis of his prophecy concerning the millennial reign of Christ is based on the victory they have just won over the Assyrian army. Mm -hmm. And he is making an analogy as he looks at that victory God allows him to look through time and see another victory. And that's going to be a victory over the Antichrist and the vict great victory that will be. His, uh, uh, the people here, you can imagine, they're gathering in the streets, they are rejoicing, they're clapping their hands, and they're showing gratitude to God over the great victory of the Assyrians. His prophecy then begins, and he says this, He's by giving God the glory for the overthrow of the enemy. Notice they are shouting to God. Notice that verse number one. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. So, so here's what he's doing here. And, and, and by the way, we need to learn this lesson. He's saying, folks, this is not a result of our army overthrowing the Assyrians. This is not, a, listen, we had nothing to do with that. That was not a result of our strategizing. Uh, this is not a result of our preparation for war. This is a result of, of a God in heaven that has proved himself strong over the enemy and we need to praise God for what he's done. Amen. And what Hezekiah is saying here is this, this is not the last time God will prevail over his enemies. I'm so glad of that. This is not the last time. What Hezekiah is saying that this Assyrian army that they are experiencing great victory over right now, this is just a picture of God prevailing over the devil where he will be cast into outer darkness and God rules on his throne over all the earth. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm, I'm going to... I hope I'm there to see every minute of it. And uh, I know that I will be in the presence of the Lord. I just hope God gives us the opportunity to see what happens to the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, let me say, you would, listen, you would think that King Hezekiah would not have to remind the people that God gets the glory for this. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Sometimes in our life, when all of a sudden we have good days, we should, we should give God glory for that, more glory than what we do. Oh, yeah. And in this passage right here, we find where certainly the gratitude goes to God. And certainly that ought to be an immediate response. But sometimes we forget and we become ungrateful for what God's done. But now, listen, listen right here what I'm about to say. Because sometimes our fears of today's trials is because we're not remembering what God did for us in the last trial. That's right. That's right. Amen. Think back. Yes, sir. A lot of the fears that we have in our hearts today is because we're forgetting what God has done for us in the past. That's right. Yes. And I want to remind you tonight, the God of the victories of days gone by is the God that will give us victory today. Amen. And we That's don't right. need to forget that. Uh, we, need to, we need to have enough thanksgiving in our heart to carry us through the next trial. Listen, today is not, it shouldn't be a day of fear. Today should not be a day of doubting the blessings of God. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
God wants us to live in faith. He does not want us to live in fear. Uh, God, has, listen, God has never been defeated. He's never lost one war, not one war. And Hezekiah is saying, hey, don't just rejoice in what's been done. Rejoice in who did what's been done. That's right. Rejoice in God. You know what? Tonight, God is good. Oh, yeah. Amen. God is good. I understand that we're going through difficult days, and I understand that some people have gone through a great deal of sickness, but I want you to know God's still good. That's God's right. never done us wrong. That's right. And uh, he's a perfect God, and a perfect God treats us completely perfect. Yeah. And so uh, we need to praise God tonight. Yeah. Hezekiah bases this prophecy once again, as I said, over the Assyrian army being overthrown. Uh, this was not some freak accident, was not some work of nature. It was not a product of man's wisdom. This was an act from Almighty God. Mm. For the Lord Most High is terrible, he says. He is a great king over all the earth. Mm. Now, you know what? It would be a great thing, and, and we're not going to do a deep study here, but it would be great just to study the names that God uses here. And, uh, and just that alone gives us reason to rejoice. He talks about the Lord in verse 2. The name Lord means, and he reminds us that he is a covenant-keeping God. That's right. That means God keeps his promises. Amen. I'm thankful for that. He then goes on. He talks about the Most High. Uh, this is the title of God that will be used during the millennial reign. It is the word Elyon, and it's the term that means that he is the possessor of heaven and earth. How appropriate when he will be king over all the earth. Can I tell you, today's victory is just a reminder we're on the winning side. Amen. Right. We're on the winning side. Verse number two, he says that he is terrible. That means that he is fear-inspiring. If you go back to the story, it's found in the book of Kings and again in Chronicles. The story tells us about a man by the name of Rabshakeh. He was the Assyrian propagandist. Uh, you could say he was the media man of his day. And uh, he had belittled the king. Uh, he had belittled the nation of Israel. He had belittled the God of heaven. But friend, when it came down to the end, Rabshakeh was dead in his tent That's and right. God was on the throne. Amen. That's right. Now, uh, verse number three and four, he looks beyond this battlefield and he looks through the ages of time where the armies of the world will march toward Jerusalem once again. You see, this is not the last time Jerusalem will be attacked. There is coming a day when the nations of the world will come against Jerusalem. Now, just get this picture. He says that God has defended Jerusalem, but in the end, the armies of the world, and once again, you look in scripture, you'll find that they will be from the north. They will come down to invade one more time. You know, what are nations army are they? Well, you know what? I'm sure that you have heard about them in the news. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, even through through the years, there have been uh, nations that have tried to destroy the people of God. And nobody can tell me how that the little nation of Israel has survived all of these attacks except by the providence and hand of God. Amen. God right. is the one that has allowed Israel to prosper. Uh, one day, these nations are going to march down again. And Hezekiah says, he's, he basically says in essence, I've got word for you, you're going to lose. Right. He basically says, just as sure as God killed the Assyrians last night, mm -hmm. he's going to kill those armies that are going to come over the nation of Israel. Right. You know what? Think about this. He was saying to the nation of Israel, we don't just win tonight, we're going to win forever. And can I say this to the Christian? We don't just win tonight. We're going to win forever. Amen. You know what? If death should come, think about this. What's the worst thing that can happen to you if death comes? Well, you just die and go to heaven. 
Think about that. I remember John R. Rice one day was held up in an elevator and he was a great preacher, great man of God. And uh, somebody put a gun on him in the elevator and he looked square at him. He was on his way preaching, getting ready to preach in a meeting. The man pulled the gun on him and uh, John R. Rice said, you can't scare me of heaven. You know what? The man didn't know what to do. He put it away and he just walked off. And, and you know what? That's the way it is for the child of God. I know. We, listen, I know that things are going to be rough down here from time to time. But listen, we're going to heaven. We're on our way there. And uh, listen, neither the Antichrist nor the United Armies of the West or the Kings of the East will ever win over the Jews. Right. Now listen, some bad things have happened, certainly. But I'm telling you, the Jews will not be annihilated. That's right. And uh, you see, the time will come. Uh, all the armies are going to come together and they're going to decide once and for all that they are going to destroy the Jews. Mm. And there's no way that they can defend themselves against all of the nations of the world. And they'll come against, but they, and they'll be led by the Antichrist. And Hezekiah said, you write down this story. You remember this story, what God did the night of the Assyrians by just one angel. He says to Israel, listen, you can clap your hands, you can rejoice, because the same God that destroyed the Assyrian army is going to destroy all of the armies of the north when they invade Israel, and God is going to defeat the Antichrist. I believe that. And uh, I want to say tonight, uh, we're going through a battle. You say, well, preacher, uh, are you afraid? Uh, no, I, I got to say, I'm not afraid. You say, why is that? Because God's in control. That's right. You know what? I know God gave us a brain and he expects us to use it and we're supposed to make common sense decisions and, and uh, we're supposed to do common sense things in order to keep ourselves protected. I understand all of that. God gives wisdom. But listen, you know what? My main priority should be doing is doing the will of God in this day and age that I live so I can please God and stand before him in confidence at his coming. Yes. Now that's what I need. Yes, that's what I want. But I want to tell you tonight, listen, there's no reason why a Christian should live in fear. No reason for it. Uh, we're supposed to live in faith. So in verse number, so in verse four, in the first four verses, excuse me, we have the great prophecy. And then we have a great proclamation. And I'm not going to spend as long on this uh, second half of the chapter as I did the first. I promise you. But I, I, I don't have the time to get in all of this. But I want to give you just enough that I hope will be a blessing to you. Hezekiah's call for the people to praise the Lord was not just for their present victory. It was for the coming victories and the final victory when armies would rise against them no more. There's a lot of fear going around today about what's happening. And uh, can I tell you, listen, listen, whenever I pick up the word of God, I always find where God wins. That's right. God never has lost. That's right. He has always won. Uh, he's always been a winner and God has never lost a battle. Why should I live in the fear of men? Just do what God says do. That's what God wants. Now, I understand that uh, here during this passage, and, and listen, let me, let me just uh, jump right ahead just a few moments. Uh, let, let me say this. As we talk about the praise that has been mentioned in this passage, you know what? There's something about praise that attracts God. If you look down at verse number six, notice what is said here. He says, sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our king. Sing praises. Did you notice there how many times it says for us to sing? There are 13 words in this verse and four times it's mentioned for us to praise the Lord. You know what? There's something to praise God about today. Today. Uh, right now is the time to rejoice. Uh, um, you want to get God's attention tonight? Start praising him. Start praising him. You know, a, a Christian that does not praise God 
is a sad Christian. That's right. A sad one. And I guarantee you they're not receiving the blessings of God that he wants to give them in their life. God encourages us to bless him, to praise him. Uh, give God glory. Let God know that you love him. Let God know that you appreciate him. Listen, don't look at the size of your problems. Look at the size of your God. Amen. That's right. Look at the size of him. Verse 6 tells us, and I just mentioned it, sing praises to God. Now, verse number 5 I'm going to back up there just a moment. Remember, this is a prophecy, and I want us to read it with that in mind. Verse 5 says, God is going up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Now, this is a prophecy, and I really believe he's talking here about Acts chapter number 1, when Jesus ascends and goes back to heaven. The word going up here is the same word that means rapture. Mm -hmm. And it means the word exalted. The word exalted means to be lifted up above. And so the Lord Jesus rose from the grave and he ascended into heaven. And that's where he is tonight. Now listen, if Christ came and suffered at the hands of evil men and he died on the cross for our sins and he overcame death, hell, and the grave, then there is no enemy that I should fear tonight. That's right. There is no enemy. So, you know, what we fear most tonight, most people fear death. Mm -hmm. But what is it that Christ conquered at Calvary? He conquered death. He gained the victory over death. Death is but a door to our eternal home. That's right. Mm -hmm. Verse number six talks about the reception of Christ in glory. Think about this. Can you imagine whenever Jesus must have stepped through the gates of heaven after he had been on earth for 33 years? Can you imagine the receptions the angels gave him when he walked through those gates? I mean, folks, that literally happened. He's sitting on the throne tonight. He had to get through that throne, to that throne and, and, but, and he died on the cross for our sins and went back to heaven. You know what? They must have been amazed when Jesus walked through the gates and saw the wounds in his hands, the wounds in his feet, the wounds were the crown of thorns. Is that not what Zechariah was talking about in chapter 13, verse 6, where he says, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, the, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Mm. Listen, Jesus is in heaven tonight receiving the praises of the angels of God, of all of the redeemed that have died before us. Hezekiah is saying, listen, you think there's praise to, today with us rejoicing because of 185,000 Assyrians are dead? You just wait till you get to heaven. You're going to hear a lot more praising than this. And King Hezekiah here is just anticipating this future ascension of Christ when he goes back into the presence of his heavenly father. Then look at verse number seven. We see the return of Christ from glory. Look at verse number seven. It says, for God is the king, now notice this, of all the earth. Then the Bible says, it says, sing ye praises with understanding. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ now has come back to earth and he is king over all the earth. Mm -hmm. He is reigning over the, the world. And when Jesus comes back, the Bible talks about how that one day his foot will be put again on Mount Olives and it will cleave in two and he will descend in great power and great glory. Listen, this is the great proclamation of Hezekiah's prophecy here that one day Jesus is coming back to earth. He will not come as a lamb. He will come as a lion That's right. to reign. Look at verse number eight and nine. Uh, the Bible says, God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together even the people of the God of Abraham, 
For the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. Yes. Let me just make a comment on this last verse and I'll be finished tonight. When we come to this place, all quarantines are over. Let me say this. It's not just of any viruses and pandemics around the world. I'm talking about there's no more quarantining of preachers in jail for preaching the gospel. That's right. I'm talking about no more quarantines over Christians that are in, are, are in prison just over the simple fact that they are Christians. That's right. I think about North Korea tonight and how that if you're a Christian there, you're automatically in prison. Mm. I think about in many Muslim countries tonight. I think about Iran and all these other places. Listen, there, there have been many times that believers have suffered persecution, been quarantined because of their faith in God. But listen, one of these days, all of these restrictions are going to be gone. Right. Hmm. We're going to be with Christ. What a gathering that will be. Oh, yes. The Bible says that all the princes of the world will gather together. Then it says, the shields belong to God. That's a very interesting phrase. As I read that and studied for preparation for this, I, I don't know, that just does something to my heart tonight that the shields belong to God. You know what? When Jesus comes to reign, he will be the prince of peace who will come to destroy all of the weapons that man have made. The Bible says that when the millennial reign comes, that spears will be made into pruning hooks. Swords will be made into plowshares. The Bible doesn't say this, but I can just imagine this. Tanks will become tractors. <laughs> All right? Soldiers will become civilians. And the Bible does say this. Men will learn and study war no more. Amen. Amen. That 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ is just a prelude to all eternity. And I say tonight to every Christian, you have reason tonight to clap your hands. You've got reason tonight to rejoice. The victory's ours. I don't know what's gonna happen with this virus. We might all die. I hope for goodness not. But you know what? If we do, we're going to a better place. Oh, yeah. Amen. And Jesus Christ will come and reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, why should I fear? Think about this. They faced Pharaoh. They don't have any more problems with Pharaoh. <laughs> they faced the Assyrians. They don't have any more problems with the Assyrians of that day, they had no problem with King, they had a big problem with King Nebuchadnezzar. They don't have a problem with him tonight. They had a problem with Nero. They don't have a problem tonight. And listen, God, listen, has no problem tonight protecting his own children. That's right. And the Bible says we're in the center of his hand. That means to me, whatever gets to me, has to go through the providence of God first. That's right. mm -hmm. And God may allow it. He may. Mm -hmm. But I am assured tonight, have peace in my heart, that God will only allow, and I will only face what God allows right. me to face. Mm -hmm. And all the way to the end, I know that God is a winner. The verse says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Hmm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you tonight for this song. And Lord, what a wonderful sequel it was as Hezekiah, as he began to write this second song, the first one in faith that he would win. And then, Lord, the second one as he looks over what you had already done and he writes thanking you and praising you for what you've done. And Lord, I'm looking forward to the day when, Lord, you come to this earth and rule and reign. Lord, that does not mean that you are not in control today because you are. 
And Lord, I'm just looking forward to the day when the Prince of Peace will rule over all the earth. And Lord, we're looking forward to that day. And Father, I pray for someone here tonight that does not know you as Savior, that they'd trust you tonight. And Lord, I pray that Christians, their hearts would be encouraged that, Lord, you're our God and you're our King. And Lord, I pray, Lord God, that we would trust you during these times. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good night.